We back in the lab, we making some noise, so go turn your decibels up. Yeah. Black skin, white coat, oh no, who was nice as us? Made Jim a sin, really told us no limits, so we about to take this up. Went from mixing in the kitchen to the lab, and now, now I can make this up. Whoa. Be shy, be scientist, be shy, be scientist. We shining a light on the people of color to show them how fly it is. Be shy, be scientist, be shy, be scientist. We back in the lab with white coats on our back, time to show what time it is. Hey. And welcome back to the Be Scientist Podcast, a podcast by the Black Science Coalition and Institute, or b When you hear this noise, that is our in-podcast citation. So please head over to b-side.org, backslash b-scientist, to see all of our citations ever. I am geoarchaeologist Jordan Chapman, and as always, we have the dope chemist herself. Jana Carpenter. And today, we have... Kojo, who is a neurosurgery candidate at Vanderbilt. Is that fair to call you? Yeah, definitely. Okay, cool. Well, it's nice to have you on the podcast today. All right. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, I really do appreciate this. So let's jump into the questions. How did you, what what made you become a scientist? So, I, I mean, I would say uh, there are like a myriad of reasons that got me to like the point that I am in now. Um, so I, I grew up in Ghana, um, in West Africa, um, uh, you know, as a kid, my, I come from a family of four boys. I'm the last born. The third born was born paralyzed. Um, so mm-hmm. I believe he had a spinal cord injury when he was being born. So personally when growing up, all I could think about was just my brother could not do things that I could do, like play soccer, or running around or do stuff like that. Cause he was always confined in his wheelchair. Um, just pushing him to school every single day. But at that point, like, I would be lying if I say that's the point I started thinking about, oh, I was so curious as to what happened to him. No, I, I was just taking care of my brother because that's all I cared about. Mm-hmm. Um, just pushing him to school every day and coming back back and forth. So it was until in 2009, so I was already a University of Ghana student and I won the U.S. Diversity Lottery visa. So it's, it's a program that the United States has that bring people from low middle income countries to the United States with a green card. And then after five years of working within the system, you get, you become a citizen. So, Mm. and it's super hard to get. It's, it's kind of like a lottery thing. They do it. And then it's like once in a lifetime you win it. So I I did it one time and then I won it once. Right. Um, so I came in 2009 and when I came, I ended up, um, getting a job as a housekeeping in a hospital, um, in Georgia, um, Gwinnett medical, which is now Northside Gwinnett. So during the housekeeping, I saw a lot of physicians in the hospital, especially the surgeons. And I, I did not see a lot of people who looked like me. And I, I was just wondering, plus coming to the United States, you know, when you're in Ghana or when you're in like a lot of these African countries and you're looking at the United States from a different like mirror or lens, um, you, you think you're coming to heaven, uh, honestly. Like, you know, you, you have this picture because you see a lot of all these you know, music videos and then you're mm. like always picturing, okay, this is the kind of life I want to come to, right? right. And then you get here and then you are hit it, like, you are hit with um, the reality of race relations in the United States. And then you're like, oh, wait, what? Like, this is how <laughs> things are like. So just looking at all the physicians in the hospital, I just did not see a lot of people who look like me. Mm-hmm. And um, I just felt, I was like, you know, why Why can't I be this? Like, why, why is it, the, the, like, why isn't it this the norm? that I can be this kind of person. So I started questioning myself, even though I was doing housekeeping. Um, so I, one thing about me is every um, situation that I find myself in, I try to figure out like what are the resources around me that I, how can I take advantage of those resources? So even in housekeeping, I started asking the surgeons and the, uh, the physicians in the hospital, hey, how can I shadow you? I would love to shadow you. you know, some of them ignored me because, again, you're housekeeping. And if you know, if you understand the hospital system, people in housekeeping are seen as the least, most important people in a hospital. So mm-hmm. as a very young person, honestly, people also came with their own perceptions about me. Um, as, you know, a 21 year old at the time, doing housekeeping in a hospital, young black kid, like everyone is assuming like you either coming from jail, you did something wrong in life, you messed up in life big time, and that is why you're doing this. Because part of the reason is a lot of the housekeepers were, you know, African-Americans, Hispanics, 
who were in their sixties, fifties, and then you know you see a twenty one year old is not the norm, right? Right. So I I just felt like okay, this is something that I really really want to do. Um, started asking the surgeons, um, people around it, you know, found one person who decided to take a chance, um, on me. That time I started from the community college. Um, so the realization was not seeing people around me who looked like me. But then when I started the community college, I started with chemistry. Um, I, I majored in chemistry and fell in love with it. Um, I, you know, for me, I didn't have a science background coming from Ghana, but when I did the chemistry, you know, it was difficult, honestly, because again, I did not do any science in high school. Mm-hmm. Um, so the first time I heard about atoms or periodic table was actually in college, like here <laughs> right. in the United States. So it was, it was new, it was super hot. However, there were several like black, I would, I'm, I'm being specific, black faculty at Georgia Perimeter who took a special interest in me. So Miss Naranja Davies, um, Miss, uh, like there's so many people that I'm trying to like, you know, Dr. Major, um, you know, Dr. Legit Robinson or Georgia Perimeter College who took a special interest in me and advised me to take on research, um, whilst, whilst I was at GPC. And personally, you know, at the time that I started Georgia Perimeter, I believe I was like 23 years old. So in my mind, I was like, listen, I just want to get through here, transfer and leave. I don't want to be spending time doing research or taking extra years off um, um, in my undergrad because um, I'm, I'm super old compared to my classmates who are all 17, 18 years, you know, coming coming straight from high school. So, you know, they, they convinced me. So I took on a research position at Georgia State uh, in my first year under um, Dr. Swazid Morin, um, basically studying organo- organic chemistry synthesis, basically um, um, synthesizing like um, uh, basically like compounds to help with like cancer cell metastasis and stuff like that. And that really started my whole science journey. Um, and, you know, I ended up transferring to Emory and, you know, majoring in neuroscience and continuing my research as well. So that is how it all started. Um, and at that point in time, I started to reflect more on my brother's situation, right? And and because, again, I felt this was probably like a second chance from God, um, giving me a second chance to really look at life from a different lens or a different perspective. So, when I started Georgia Perimeter and all these influential people in my life actually um, influenced me on this path in science, then I began to reflect on the situations in Ghana and everything. And that, that really sparked my whole scientific journey. Dope, dope. Wow. And it, it just seems to be kind of like a really an exponential growth starting from like not knowing any science to like now you're doing neurosurgery. I mm-hmm. mean, that's that's kind of a lot to take on. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. It's just just thinking about it, like starting from like starting from a point where you knew nothing to the point where you're going into. I mean, I guess one of the most competitive specialties to get into, even as a black person. Um, like just to give, I always tell people these statistics, like just to give people perspective. So last year, neurosurgery. So in the whole United States, right, every year neurosurgery takes about two hundred and forty first year interns to train as neurosurgeons. So every year, around two hundred and forty people are you know, selected into neurosurgery to train. And last year, only eight people identified as black. Eight out of the whole 204. So neurosurgery, obviously, is a very competitive field. So meaning that before you are even considered for interviews, you have to be excellent. And, you know, I, I, I'm guessing um, you both would understand that, you know, as a black candidate or as, as a black medical student, as a black PhD student, you always have to do twice, three times, four times, five times as hard as, your, your colleagues because mm-hmm. people still question if you belong um mm-hmm. even in my medical school at georgetown you know georgetown we're about 200 um uh, i have 200 classmates and you know probably like about 12 or so of us are black um and and always like from first year to final year you just always have to prove yourself that you belong so um getting to like i feel like neurosurgery is not it's not an easy, easy thing to do, but it's just hard work, dedication, and, and trusting like your mentors um, who pretty much, again, who are guiding you throughout the whole process has been the key to, to my, my, my success story. And again, I always find myself at the right place at the right time, I would say. Um, but yeah, that, that definitely hard work. I wouldn't take that away. Uh, hard work, dedication, um, perseverance uh, played a, like, a key role. Right. I'm trying to, I'm thinking about it in my head. You said eight out of 240 um, last year. I, I'm not great at mental math, but immediately I know that's less than 10%. Yeah. 
Oh, for so, sure. Like, yeah. you know, again, because always what we're trying to achieve, the like, you know, quote unquote quota is like, what is the black population in the United States, right? right. That is pretty much around like 13% to 14%, right? Mm-hmm. So if we are using that as like, let's say the standard or the metric, right? Mm-hmm. Then we are not, we are way, way below what yeah. we're supposed to be achieving, right? right. And, and and someone would ask, oh, maybe not a lot of black people are applying. Well, that same year, almost like what, 68 or so black applicants apply. Mm-hmm. So sixty eight, only eight made it. Come on, just look at it. Like that yeah. is way way below even three percent or so. So just thinking about it in that, because people would always argue with these numbers and just say, oh, maybe only twelve black people applied and then they took eight, right? Mm-hmm. But that that is not that is not the truth. Um, but you know there are several societies the they formed the American Black Society of Neurosurgery, um, and they you know it got inaugurated last year, and just last year that that organization was formed guess what this year 24 black people matched into neurosurgery Mm -hmm. so we moved from 8 to 24 right and the 24 just so you have contest is the highest it has ever been Mm -hmm. the highest prior to that was 12 the highest ever (laughs) was 12 right and all of a sudden we moved to 24 so you went from mm -hmm. you went from what like sounded like a very low point to immediately high as soon as black people just got the bell you know, like we need to fix this basically yeah because you know again uh we we had to hold several departments accountable um mm-hmm. the organization that was formed uh association of black nurses and these are my mentors who are leading you know the field you know pushing the envelope every single day and the challenge was that you know when the i think two years ago i believe when the george floyd uh you know tragic incident happened um, a whole bunch of departments started coming out about all their DI initiatives. Mm-hmm. We support this, we support that, but then it wasn't reflecting in their actions in terms of their recruitment of right. specific, mm-hmm. like you know, black candidates, excellent candidates. Again, I always say, like the moment you talk about oh, like black candidates, everyone think like oh, we are mediocre or maybe we did not do well on exams, and then we're trying to fill a quota, affirmative action. No. Like, we have excellent candidates applying into all these specialties, right? So, when it happened and then only eight match last year, we were like, wait, what? Like, after everything that you guys said, like, mm-hmm. only eight? Mm-hmm. Come on, don't, don't tell us, like, only eight fit to be neurosurgeons, right? So, we, we, we you know, we st- kept on pushing, pushing, pushing the narrative. And, and, you know, this year, 24, so we are hoping to keep, you know, and, and even the 24 out of 240 is only 10%, right? Mm. So we're still trying to work hard. You no, know, hopefully this year we will try. We'll try to match more people. So what we've been doing is now mentoring like the current third year medical students who are applying to neurosurgery, um, the black applicants, and and trying to see ways where we could make the application more holistic and not focusing because we, we we get worried so much about test scores and like what did you score on this, what did you score on that, but the you know. A, a applicant there are so many factors that come into play to really define who an applicant is so we're trying to like really emphasize that now um moving forward right yeah could you actually tell us more about uh the nonprofit that you co-founded um the african research academics for uh, women or ac- academies yeah. sorry yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, again, you know, as, as I was reflecting, and, you know, you guys asked me about my science journey. So, you know, right after chemistry at Georgia Perimeter, I, you know, transferred into Emory and decided to, you know, do neuroscience. And again, the neuroscience started coming because I started doing some self-reflection about my brother's situation and figuring out, okay, I think, you know, this had to do with a spinal cord or the brain in some kind of capacity. So I just wanted to understand more about the brain. And um, very early on, um, whilst I was at Emory, I got engaged in the research also, you know, because, again, I did the whole organic chemistry um, research and then went into Emory and then started doing um, peripheral nerve injury research um, at Emory. And during that time, I, I, you know, I thought it was just quite unique in the United States. The students get paid, like, you know, for summer programs, get paid in the summer to come do research, right? So I was mm-hmm. like, wait, what? Like, this is so unique. Like, wow, America, like, this is great. So now looking back in, in Ghana, um, where, where I came from, it, it's quite the opposite, right? Students have to pay research institutes before mm-hmm. they have the opportunity to do research. So you, you, you can be so talented, you can be so good, but if you do, your parents don't have the resources to pay, you don't get to do research, right? right? So you go through the motion and just finish your degree. So I felt, okay, 
why can we bring people together and replicate the same model here in the United States, where this time, instead of students paying research institutes, we will pay the research institutes, so we will act as the middle people, pay the research institutes, and then also give these students stipends every month, just like what we do here in the United States, um, um, in Ghana. So, you know, it became an idea, spoke to a couple of friends of mine at Emory, and then a couple of friends at University of Pennsylvania, and we all came together. I would say it wasn't founded by one person. Um, it was a group of people that come in together. Again, you could have the concept, but without those people, all these things, you know, will not work. So we all came together, um, decided that we wanted to do this. Now, through our research and whilst we were doing this, um, we realized that there's this huge disparity between male and female scientists on the continent. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then in Ghana, specifically, Ghana has 86% male to 14% female scientists. Right. So we're like, okay, if we really want to cause a change or change the narrative, then we have to be very deliberate and intentional about what we're trying to do, right? So we decided to focus our efforts on only women. And, and I mean, again, there's always a backstory to why women, right? So my mom... My parents, both of my parents' education ended like way, way like below middle school, right? So they did not go further. My mom specifically, her dad, my grandfather did not believe in educating women because he felt, you know, which, which is very archaic way of thinking, but on, honestly, it was the norm back then, right? So mm -hmm. he believed that as a woman, you're going to get married and then take the last name of another man and move into that man's house. So why should he... Why should it be his responsibility to take care of you when you're going to leave? Right. Anyways, and carry the last name of another person, right? I mean, again, it's terrible thinking, but that was the norm. So mm -hmm. I don't want people to think about it like, oh, why are they doing this? No, like, listen, that mm -hmm. was what was happening back then, right? Yeah. So she, she couldn't go to school. So always she gave birth to four boys, mm -hmm. sadly. Uh, and, and so always she always told us, like, every time that we push in any envelope, like, we're doing anything, like, narrative, everything, we have to always take our education seriously, but also account for the other half of our population, which are women. Right. So when this whole nonprofit idea started coming and we were thinking about it, we were like, okay, hey, if we really want to change the narrative, then we need to focus on women. So what we do is, so in the spring, which the applications are currently open now, we open our applications up, students apply, like, you know, young women and graduate students from all the universities across Ghana apply they go through a regular selection process. We interview them. And then every year we select about 10 to 15 students. And then we pair them with mentors locally that they're going to do research with in the lab, right? But then we also pair them with mentors here in the United States. Part of the reason is we really want them to have a global perspective to know that the challenges that women in STEM face is not just exclusive to Ghana. It's worldwide. It's right here in the United States as well. So we give them that global perspective. And after their research summer program, in August, they do their summer presentation, like, you know, those research poster presentations. And we help them, you know, take the GRE, um, apply to graduate school, master's programs and stuff like that. So, you know, over the years, we started in 2014 and, and uh, now we're in 2022. So over the years, we've had, for just the summer program, we've had about 60 students. Sister young, you know, brilliant women passed through the program, but we've had more than 300, um, you know, young women who are part of our mentorship program. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's it just, I always make this joke, right? It's just funny. That some of our students actually are doing their PhD at UA, um, UVA, Clemson, chemistry, like chemistry PhD, third year, like people are doing incredible things across the globe, right? But I made this joke all the time. So I'm in my final year of medical school and some of our students have passed through a program and are now professors in Ghana teaching mm -hmm. at the university so it, it tells you the kind of impact and it's just a humbling experience just thinking about what we've been able to build throughout the whole journey right now that's a journey i, I mean we kind of understand here at bsa about like what it is to start a nonprofit and um try to start from the ground up so we we applaud you for that that's that's amazing yeah yeah, yeah it, it was it was it was really difficult um because i i you know started in 2014 when i was a student at emory and honestly, did not think it was going to get big. I thought we were going to do something small, maybe each year take about two, three students and you know, fund them and just do this. And in 2014, got invited to the White House um, mm -hmm. by President Obama um, in August 2014 when um, President Obama invited all the presidents from the African countries to come to the White House. So got an invitation, which mm -hmm. I initially thought it was a scam anyways. <laughs> Like, I mean, why, why would this right. black person be invited to the White House for this kind of like event? But 
I ended up going in, my name was on the guest list. And, um, and so you were still worried, is, just getting even at the door. You're yeah, like, Am right. I on the guest list? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, like, you know, yeah, you know for, for me, I was just, I just wanted to confirm. Because the funny thing is, in May, in May of 2014, I got an invitation to the White House, right? And then they said, Oh, um, for security purposes, we will need your social security, your name, yeah, and stuff like that. Okay. And when I came to the United States, the first thing that I was told is, do not mm-hmm. send your social security in an email to mm-hmm. anyone. So for me, I was like, nah, this is a scam. They're trying to get me. Nah, right. nah they're not trying to get me this time. <laughs> so in August, got the same email again. And I was like, wait, like maybe this is real. Okay, I'm just going to take a risk. <laughs> so I sent my information out. So when I got to the gate, I, you know, with the whole security and everything, I was like, listen, hey, I'm here. I just want to make sure that, you know, my name is on the list or whatever, like for this, this is an event happening. And they're like, yeah, there's an event happening here today. So I, you know, I give them my ID and stuff like that. They check, they're like, yeah, you're on the guest list. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> this That's is crazy, so, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, that White House visit, um, uh, and the society that I grew up in, in, in Ghana, we, we are taught to be very modest about stuff. So we, we don't talk about stuff that we do because people see it as you bragging or mm-hmm. something like that. So funny enough, I went to the White House in 2014, in August. Nobody knew about it. Nobody. Like even my church family did not know about it mm-hmm. until May of 2015 when I was graduating. And then Emily wrote a story about me. Right. So in that story is when it said I went to the White House, and then my whole people were like, "Yo, you went to the White House last year, and nobody knew about it." Uh, but and that put the nonprofit from point A to point B. Like now everybody got to know about the nonprofit. But that comes with these challenges, right? Because now you thought it was going to be something small. Now it's huge, right? Mm-hmm. You're invited by the President Clinton. You're being invited by um, President of Senegal. Like going to places to go talk. So then the profit is big. I want to go to medical school. And I, you know, my goal was to be a physician scientist. So in my head, I was like, okay, do I now transition from undergrad to medical school straight up or manage the nonprofit? Yeah. And at the time, the nonprofit was only a year old. So my board of directors said, listen, Kojo, um, we really like you. We really think you're going to be a great physician scientist, but we cannot approve for you to go to medical school now because this is your baby. If you leave the nonprofit and hand it over to new leadership, we don't know where it's going to go. Mm. So why don't you just manage the nonprofit for a while before you, you go to medical school? So it was a very tough decision at the time, but I ended up applying to a prep program, which is an NIH program for people who want to do, who want to be physician scientists or go to graduate school. So I did that at Mount Sinai in New York, um, Icon School of Medicine. So, you know, did two years of research, basically studying epilepsy, genetic, genetic stuff. Um, but Doing that two years gave me the flexibility to manage the nonprofit to be more self sustaining. Mm-hmm. And for me, when I started it, the whole idea was not for me to be the CEO for the rest of the nonprofit's lifespan. Right. The goal was to start something, start a conversation, push the narrative. And again, I must admit, in Ghana, as a male person leading such an initiative, it was easy to push the narrative versus if a colleague of my female person was like pushing it. So when we're able to get it more, you know, up on the ground, things running, like the profit is big, we're getting a lot of donations in. Then I stepped down from my role in 2017. And then we appointed um, Yvonne. So Yvonne, she's a professor at Johns Hopkins um, School of Nursing and the Public Health School. She took over the nonprofit in 2017 as the CEO. And then I decided to step back um, from my role. And, you know, she actually, she's been running a nonprofit more years than I did. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, I did 2014 to 2017 and now. She's still running it. So 2022, she's still she's still the CEO. So it was the decision that I had to intentionally take to make it self-sustaining, step down, and then decided to focus my energy on building the competencies to becoming a physician scientist. Right. I do. I think uh, I don't mean to catch you off, Jenna, but I just want to say I think that is like the tough part of um, being like one of the founding um, people of a nonprofit and then also being like. Um, like the founding president, because as, as like the founding president of, of B-Side, it is like, I uh, look forward to the day where we get to the point where there is a second president, because one that just established that to me, that means that it is no longer just your baby. And I think that is like the the honor of doing this is that you don't want it to because if it's just your if it's 
um i think i don't i forget the like designation but you can start your own like solo business but that's never the point if you're start. i don't think that's the point to start a nonprofit. is for it to just be your nonprofit. if you wanted to just do that like you can go start like your own foundation and you can be in charge of all those decisions you can just have a bunch of yes people behind you but i think that having a board of directors or as in bsop we call them our board members like then that is the point is so that one day maybe one of those people or someone else you haven't met yet comes along and they take up the mantle but i i do i think that's the right decision man so i again i, I agree man that's that's just dope yeah, yeah, yeah. Th- th- thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, I I hundred percent agree with, with 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 your comment. Um, and and that is something that we we thought of very early on. And again, I I told everyone, listen, this is a very linear structure. Uh, yeah, I'm the CEO, but it's just a title. Okay, we all exactly. share ideas. Mm-hmm. We all all do this thing together. And you know what has contributed to the success, right, of, of everything that we've been able to build is in the beginning, I made sure all of us, all the team, felt as part owners of what we're building, because in nonprofit, number one, you're not paying anyone to volunteer mm-hmm. their time, mm-hmm. right? So you have if someone is not feeling like they are part owners of what we are all building together, or they feel like, oh, this is called just nonprofit, so let me just go help him achieve his dream, mm-hmm. then people do not really do much or really take themselves out into the position or their role. Um, so I, you know, in the beginning, I was like, listen, we are all building this thing together. This is for all of us. If we succeed, we all succeed. If we fail, we all fail. And funny thing is when I stepped down because of the culture that I was able to build, when I stepped down from my role in 2017, the same team members from the nonprofit in 2014, are still with the team in 2022. Mm-hmm. They didn't leave. So it made transition for Yvonne coming into the CEO role very easy because when she came, the person was in charge of finance finance is the same person mm-hmm. the person who is in charge of partnerships is the same person right so nobody left because if i had made it all about me or what i wanted to build and all this non-profit and all this kind of stuff in 2017 the moment i left all these people would not have been motivated enough to still join mm-hmm. and would have just also stepped back and these are also medical students and some are in residency right now and and i'm now you know transitioning to residency so i knew they were very busy people but then we started on with a very a culture that was very very linear everyone's opinion mattered and everyone like we took everyone's perspective into consideration so i think that is and that is the advice to young people out there who are trying to start nonprofits it's not it's not about you Mm-hmm. You have to think about the goal, the bigger picture. What are you trying to build? You're trying to impact the lives of young women, for instance, us. We're trying to impact the lives of young women in Ghana, right? So that should be the main focus and not necessarily about how you can reach all the, get all these accolades and stuff like that. Those those things come, it's a plus, but those are not the, the, the main reasons why we do what we do. Right. Yeah, that is that is truly incredible. And I think that's what's really nice about, I think, social media these days is because I did notice that, you know, you, you continually uplift... Uh, people who have also gotten a residency program somewhere or just, you know, any kind of accolade, you know, you have to uplift each other because it does take a community to kind of grow in these, in these positions. And so um, Mm. I just really like that, that you still continue to do that and and contribute uh, in your own way. Yeah. It it gives me joy, joy to celebrate the successes of us. Um, I I think God, you know, I, I'm a very like big Christian, so I I think God blesses me in that kind of capacity because I I always do not envy someone's success. I I would love to celebrate you, um, uh, and so that whenever I need help, I know the people that I reach out to, mm-hmm. uh, and, and every human being we can never be an island, and and I think. That is something that we've struggled with um, um, in terms of the black community to be able to uplift each other. Um, and it's a very tough thing to do, especially when I always say this analogy, right? So they've created a system in the United States where we are all fighting for like, let's say 24 spots, right? We are all fighting for those 24 spots, even though we deserve 100, mm-hmm. right? Like think about it that way. We deserve 100, but they've created a systems in the United States where we are all fighting for the 24. And then the, because we are all fighting for the 24, our mindset is that we are all fighting for 24. So we start to you know, cause trouble with each other, fight one another, say this, bad things about this. But if we look at a big, bigger picture and say, we deserve to be 100. So why are we even fighting for 24 when we could bring in so many other people to join us? For us mm-hmm. to be 100, right? So it's just, 
it's a, it's a, it's a mindset, right? It's a narrative. So I, I always take every opportunity to celebrate successes for people here in the United States, in Ghana, everywhere else. What, what they are doing, I think, is incredible because it also inspires a lot of people to see people looking like them that they can also get to that same position. So, I mean, every little, and I mean, again, that is something similar to what you guys are doing here. Um, you know, people listening to these kind of like talks, like they're like, wow, this person was able to get here. I think I can do it as a black kid, right? So that is very, very important. We need to control our own stories, okay? We shouldn't let people tell our stories for us. We should control our own narrative. And I think, you know, it, you know as time goes on, we'll be able to like, you know, do great things. Yeah, I totally agree with that because I, I know I really enjoy having these kinds of discussions because I will even myself talk myself out of like, you know, doing something because I'm just like, oh, this is so much work, you know, oh, I don't know if I want to do all this. But, you know, you talk to people and they're like, you know, you can't give up on yourself. You can't give up on the people that are, have helped you along the way, who have mentored you. And it's really encouraging because it's like it's so easy to lose sight of like, why you're doing what you're doing. So um, I just really commend that, hearing that from you. I'm trying to find who said it because I remember um, last year, was it last year? Anyway, um, the Black and Neck Conference happened, uh, I think last year, I think it was 2021, the summer of last year. Um, and I had the uh, honor of being the, uh, the moderator for a co-founder's corner or something like that. And one of the women there um who i can't remember the name of and i also can't remember her organization but i'm trying to remember it and i'm also struggling to remember the quote but essentially when something like don't compete a uh, collaborate or something like that i'm paraphrasing here but i have taken at the heart um because like it is easy to see the success of others and other organizations and try to go oh man like why aren't we there uh well we need it and, it, and you're right it, it becomes like that capitalist mindset where we it's got to be there's always got to be a winner and there always has to be a loser and then you'll hear people talk about it like that you know in the classic thing people like to say when they have that mindset it's like oh there's only two types of people in this world it's like no that's not true there's not just two types of people there's a whole spectrum of people in a whole spectrum of way things can happen yes there will be people who succeed more and people who probably don't do as well but that is to a spectrum and in the case of like looking at other black people, we have to think about it that way because like there is a spectrum. And if we don't think about it that way, it just limits the way we can help each other and how we interact in our community. So I completely agree with that. I agree. I agree. I agree. I, people always say we're not a monolith, right? Exactly. We, we're all not the same. There are so many factors that contribute to different people in certain circumstances and certain situations. So we have to look at things from the holistic point of view and not necessarily just looking at one picture and just say, oh, this person, this black person did this. No, no. We have to really take a look at the whole picture every single time. Mm -hmm. So we, we briefly talked about the match process in a previous episode, but I was just curious if you could explain it to us because even I'm still a little confused about it and it seems just really scary in general and... I don't know. Could you tell us about it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's a very complicated process, and it's so hard always explaining it to my family, especially when I was going through it. Because, you know, they were always asking, okay, so you, you're going here, right? And I'm like, nah, that, that's not how it works. But anyway, so, you know, every medical student, so third year, you go through clinical rotations, and the expectations is that after third year, you should know what you want to do, right? Like, that is the kind of specialty you want to do. So, you... In final year of medical school, you decide, okay, so I'm just going to use myself as an example so that it makes it more easier, right? Not generalized more. Like, so in fourth year, I decide, okay, I want to do neurosurgery. Then there's something called acting internship where you do at your home program, right? So at Georgetown, I did one month of neurosurgery rotation where they train you, you act like you're a first year resident, right? So they train you to be like, hey, this is what you should be expecting. This is what life is going to feel like when you start. Yeah, is it reality? Not necessarily because so your student, they still let you go home like early and stuff like that. But you do that for one, one month. Then you have the opportunity to also go do the same thing at an, another institution where you're interested in, like, or for some strange reason, based off on geographical location, you think it's the best fit. So, for instance, I went to Emory University uh, in Georgia, you know, because, I'm again, when I came to the United States, first place I went to is Georgia. So I always wanted to go back down south. So then I did my one-month rotation. Then they write a letter to support your application. 
you submit you there's something called the ERAS application where you submit all your application in um by end of September with your letters of recommendation. Now after you apply, depending on you know who you are or how competitive you think you are or what specialty you're applying to, you apply to different ranges of programs in different you know places across the country. Then the programs that take a look at your application and they're like, oh, we like Kojo, will invite you for an interview, right? So for instance, I ended up interviewing at Emory, Vanderbilt, uh, all these wonderful places, UCLA, Harvard, Massachusetts General, Harvard Program, all these wonderful places, Cleveland Clinic. And then after they review your application, they invite you for an interview, you interview, right? You interview, you go show who you are, you, you know, go smile all day on through Zoom. You know, initially it was, it was, it was in person. So people would have to travel to all these places. So for instance, me, I would have traveled to California, then went to Massachusetts, then go to all these, you know, Michigan, go to all these places. But I pressed the wrong button. Uh, I was trying to uh, ask you a question. Do you, do you have to pay for that? Oh, oh yes. Yes. Oh. So the application process is, I mean, hey, I, I don't know, like, listen, people control these systems and stuff, but it's super expensive, right? So, for instance, if you apply to, let's say, 100 programs or so, you probably will be spending about probably like 3000 to $4,000 on just the application. And again, you're applying, it does not guarantee that you're going to get a job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> again. So it, when you hear people say, this is my third time applying, this is my second time applying, think about the money also. Meaning that these folks have been spending almost close to about seven thousand or eight thousand dollars over the past few years applying everything. Because the moment you don't match, the next year you probably would apply to more programs than before. Mm-hmm. Meaning you'd spend more money than before, right? So always, always think about. It. So it's not, it's not free. You apply, you spend, you know, thousands of dollars depending on your specialty, also, right? New York is super competitive, so nobody's going to apply to like less than seventy. Uh, so there's some statistics. The average neurosurgery applicant applied to, I think, 80 programs. 80. 80. 80, right? And that is almost like $2,000 or probably like 3000 right? So you apply, you interview at all these programs. The programs also interview you. So imagine if we were traveling to all these places as well. Your hotel, your flight, everything is all your own expenses. The... The sub that I had to go do at Emory is my own personal expenses. The one month that you're going to stay in Georgia, now, you know, they are doing three. Because our time, because of COVID, we we're restricted to only one away experience. So traditionally, people do two or three. So now imagine someone going to three places, like let's say University of Michigan, Emory, and then also Cleveland Clinic. All those times, that one month, you are paying to stay there for one month, right? That's After that, idea. you apply to all these programs. Then you have to travel to all these places and pay all them. And so people take $20,000 loans just for that. On top of that, you're already graduating with about $300,000 in loan as a medical student. So mm. on top of that, now you're going to take like $20,000 in loans just for application, right? So always always think about it. So you interview, you know, programs say they like you, you also like them. And then um, beginning of March, you get to rank all the programs that you interviewed at. So you cannot rank a program that you did not interview, right? So for instance, I I, I interviewed at all these places, you know, all these places, you know, all these wonderful places I interviewed at. Then I would just go through my list and just be like, okay, one is so-so and so, two is so-so and so, three is what, like all these programs I interviewed at, depending on the number of interviews that I got. Then the programs will also eat, like rank all the applicants that they interviewed, okay? So people can choose not to rank a program and also programs can also choose not to rank an applicant. So let's say it's, I interviewed at a specific program and they felt, Oh, why well, we invited Kojo for an interview, but he's not who we thought he is. He is. Nah, he's not our kind of student or, or physician that we want. So we're not going to rank him. That is dependent on the program. Right. I also interviewed at a place and I'm like, nah, I don't feel the vibe. I don't want to come here. I don't want to go over there. So I'm not going to rank it at all. But you have to also understand that whenever you are doing that as an applicant, okay, whenever you are doing that, you are saying that you'd rather not be a neurosurgeon than to go to that specific place, right? Does it make sense? Because if you're not ranking a program, imagine you not matching at that, like your top 
15 or your top and then like that program was like supposed to be like let's say your number 16 right. you were saying that you'd rather match at either the top 15 and then you're ignoring the 16 or you would not be a neurosurgeon at all you get you don't get a job so it's always advisable that especially in competitive specialties rank all programs right you know because every program is going to train you to be a competent neurosurgeon honestly right so for me i ranked every every program so then the programs also did the same thing with me um and then the ma- so there's something called the march week mostly it's the third week of march where the monday is to me personally is the biggest day because the monday at 9 a.m you get an email saying congratulations you matched unfortunately you did not match right mm. so but you not know the location where you matched Right now, when you know, I said in the beginning of March, I input my rank list, and then programs input their rank list of all the applicants, and then I also do for all the programs. Then there's a computer algorithm that tries to sort of pair everything, right? So, quick, quick explanation. So, let's say I put Vanderbilt one, and Vanderbilt put me number one. It's an automatic match, mm-hmm. regardless. I'm going to Vanderbilt, right? Let's say I put Vanderbilt 1 and Vanderbilt put me 3. Because Vanderbilt's program takes only 3 applicants, um, 3 neurosurgery residents each year, meaning that automatic match again. Now, it becomes tricky if I put Vanderbilt 1 and Vanderbilt puts me, like, let's say, 7. It would take Vanderbilt to miss out on their 3 candidates from their top 6 Right mm-hmm. before I would end up matching at Vanderbilt. Does it make sense? No, that makes sense. I see. Yes. Yeah, so, so that, that's that's basically how it works. So sometimes you know, in in comp- the reason why certain specialties are competitive is not because like I mean, again, everyone is smart in medical school. Don't get me wrong. Like everyone is able to get into graduate school, medical school, are super smart, super great at what they do. Right. When we talk about competitive specialties, it's because there are only few slots. Or a few positions, right? So neurosurgery, most programs take either one, two, or three. Only the bigger programs take four. That is probably like about three or so programs, right? So it's so hard to match at programs that are taking only two people or three people, right? Compared to other specialties that take like, let's say, 15 people or 20 applicants or 30, right? Like in some, some internal medicine programs takes 40, right? So if a program is taking 40 and then you put them number one, eh, you know, and if you interview well, you know, you, you have a chance to be part of one of the 40. But mm. if a program is taking only two people, like, mm. <laughs> what are your chances of being there? Because if, if they're taking two and then you are ranked like number 10, you're probably not get, going to get in, right? So right. that that is the whole idea about a match. And and on, fr- on, on Monday, you find out you match, but you don't know the location. And then on Friday is when you find out the location uh, at 12 o'clock. So... At 12 o'clock, we all get our envelopes and, you know, they'll send an email at 12. Hey, coach, you match at Vanderbilt. Could be your number one, could be your number seven, you could be your number 13. It doesn't really matter. As long as you got a job to me personally, as long as you got a job, that's more important. But then again, it's also nice when you got a job at where you really wanted to be at, right? Yeah. So, you know, Vanderbilt and, and, and stuff like that. So th- that is how the match works. On Monday, those who get, unfortunately, you did not match. There's something called SOAP, which is like a supplemental, um, like, I don't even know the, the full name. But, so it's called SOAP. Basically, because certain programs have a lot of slots, right? Not all programs are able to fill their slots, right? So let's say some internal medicine program that take like, let's say, 40 people, right? Because of the ranking scheme and its computer algorithm, maybe they will be, they're able to match only 30. Then they have 10 slots left, right? So only those who did not match will have access to the database of seeing all programs whose slots are still open, right? Then they basically reapply again. Now, the caveat to that is for someone applying to neurosurgery, you're more likely not to get another slot at the neurosurgery program because always neurosurgery programs fail 100%. All the competitive specialists, orthopedic surgery, dermatology, they always almost fail 100% every single time. So if you're a neurosurgery applicant, then you might start thinking about, okay, maybe I want to do general surgery now or general surgery prelim for one year or maybe something, totally something, family medicine, whatever it is, right? So you'd see all the open slots and then you apply again, you go through interviews again that week. And then on Thursday, they'll go, they have three rounds of acceptances. 
that programs will now call you to say, hey, we've, we've accepted you, or we've, you know, stuff like that. If you go through that and then you don't still match, then there's something called scramble. So after the Friday where everyone has found out where they are going, where they are heading, people are, you know, enjoying with your family, then for you, all you have to do now is like be contacting programs and begging them, hey, can you please give me a spot? Like stuff like that. So that is a scramble. So this is what medical students have to go through. Oh, man. The whole <laughs> that whole match. Is oh, and, and, man. The, and I must add that the person who created that computer algorithm uh, for the match thing won a Nobel Prize. For <laughs> yeah, so hey. He that, won a what? A Nobel Prize. He won a Nobel Prize for that? Yeah, for yeah, for economics. So that algorithm. Oh, that for economics. Yeah, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. No. no, but it was that same algorithm that he did it in economics, and then they are applying it to medicine. Okay, I so, see. Yeah, yeah. I was so, gonna say, I figure it should be like psychology because that's some mental math that I'm some, just not yeah, really. It's torture. Is what for. it is. Gosh, <laughs> sheesh. You get yeah. cause, like that's a lot to have to go through, and then like what you're saying about like this baked in part of like the systematic racism that you're getting at too is like no mm-hmm. wonder that like it's so tough out there is like if because like if you're saying it's like one or two spots and it's like oh well we match well or or like we do the interview and it's like oh a court and it's already like so leaned toward like white applicants in the first place it's like oh okay well we just had a vibe with this white person it's like yeah of course because that's all you have here is you didn't have like the ability to, t- to speak to all of these students on their same level so of course that's going to happen so then that happens you just so you're already just nerfing all the black like black people underrepresented population already getting nerfed at, at during, during the first round of it then they do the soap and then that probably happens a little bit again maybe not as much and then the scramble it just so like three rounds just to weed out people who probably should be there and that's that's yeah. crazy yeah it's, it's a it's a very big systemic issue because um, people go through medical school with huge loans right yeah and, and then they are done and then your family is expecting them to become doctors right practicing medicine and then they go on mash i mean it's a big systemic issue what, what, what one of my mentors said this like, and i think about it he says like likes like okay? mm-hmm. people who look like each other, like the people who look like them, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's, a, it's a great, it's, it's a true phenomenon. That's a it fact. Is. I people mean, who are more drawn towards people who look like them. It's just simple. Yeah, mm-hmm. it is. You know, it so, is. So going through this process, you know, for instance, neurosurgery, like you know, a program. Some of the programs that I interviewed at, they would have like let's say three hundred and sixty applicants, right? Overall applicants, right? And then they would weed out and only interview like thirty six people for three spots, right? 36 people for three spots. So imagine like 36 people, probably like there are only like one or two black people in that mix. And then they are going to rank all those 36 applicants, right? So how, like, I don't know, like how sure are you that you're going to be in their top two, top three, top five? Because the moment you get to top 27, eh, then, you know, you're like very, very yeah. shaky in terms of you, <laughs> your chances of matching. So uh, it's a very, uh, I mean, again, they say it works. I, I I have no complaints about it. So I'm just <laughs> so then, yeah, I just I just I just hope they, they find a better way to make sure that people who go through four years of medical education do not end up not getting a job. I, I don't yeah. think it's fair. I don't think it's fair to a lot of people. And again, the funny thing is they don't bring these statistics out, right? According to race. How many go unmatched, right? Mm-hmm. But we all know, we all know <laughs> that we all know. Like yeah. I mean is the unspoken truth um, right. that a lot of black African um, black applicants do not match, um, and, and you know now people are pushing the narrative for um, the WMC and the National Resident Matching Program to bring out these statistics. Right. We want to know how many. Like, is it based off on racial demographics? Like, what is happening? Why are mm-hmm. like and there are a lot of black physicians matching or um, Hispanic um, physicians matching? So we. I, I hope they, they, they eventually give in and bring out these numbers, but you know, over the years they've not they've never done that. So we, we don't we just don't know. That's crazy. Oof. And the other thing that I keep thinking about is is, you know, once you figure out where you're going and you don't know until that Friday, like, you know, your family, you're having to, to uproot where you're at and just, yeah, okay, I'm gonna go here, I guess, and work for seven years. Like that's <laughs> That must also yeah, be kind it, of crazy. <laughs> it's, it's, it's tough, especially because you, you don't know, right? You, you don't know. Like, let's say I could have just opened my letter that day and found out that, oh, I'm going to 
somewhere like that I have no idea about that place, right? I was just very lucky that I got to a place where we really wanted to go to, right? So and then also back down south. But it's like you you can just open the thing and then you're like you, you can see from the face of people, like people are shocked sometimes. Like they just look at it and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to North Dakota. Like <laughs> I, 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 have, I have nothing against places like that. But I'm just saying, like, people, right. I mean, it really doesn't matter. It could be Georgia and people would be like, oh, my God, I don't want to go to the <laughs> South. You know, stuff like that. Um, So um, I, like, it's, it's, it takes a lot of mental energy yeah, for to sure. go through. I mean, I, I think the relief is I got a job on Monday, right? You know, you, mm. you, you, you get an email, you've matched. So it takes a lot of heavy load off you. But then now your family are all, you know, they've all traveled like near and far to come support you. And they're all sitting there waiting. Okay, so where are you heading to now? Oh, are you going to stay here? And then you have no idea. And then on Friday, you find out and you're like, oh my, now I have to think about moving costs. Like even just right now, we have to move to Nashville and Mm -hmm. just moving is costing us almost like $6,000. Just moving. Just just moving, moving my whole family, wow. um, um, you know, down to Nashville. So it's a very expensive process. It's a mentally draining process, and and imagine going through that whole interview, um, um, time and like your your family keep keep asking you, oh, so you're coming back here, right? Or oh, you're going here, right? And you're trying to explain to them that I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't know until Friday. <laughs> right. um, it, it's it's mentally draining, and, and um. I mean, again, I don't blame them because they, they don't really understand the system. Some even, some medical students don't even understand the system. Um, mm-hmm. So it, it's, it's a tough process to be in, honestly. But, you know, again, I, I'm very excited and very happy that I am now at the other end now. And now I, I can see new applicants introducing themselves. Then they come in through the cycle. I'm like, oh, my gosh, just wait and see. <laughs> I mean, I still barely understand grad school in itself. And this is a whole other system right here. So, again, just... Shout out to you guys, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but we are we are probably reaching about an hour at this point, I'm guessing. Um, so we usually end our podcast by asking, how do you encourage other people to be scientists? So I would say, first of all, you need to find your niche, right? Like find something that you're very, very passionate about, very, very curious about. When something that you can not, like, you know, I, I know a lot of people who hate to be in the lab or, or or do like even science or you know the clinical research or even engage in any some some any form of science right but you just have to really really sit down and figure out okay is this the kind of environment that i want to be in will i be very happy doing this every single day of my life like again you have to think about it but then whilst you think about that you have to think about a bigger picture right how is this my like if i engage in this specific activity this scientific activity how is it going to impact society in general, right? And I think the moment you start thinking about that, and then also looking at as yourself, my advice to people is always see yourself as a mentor. You may not necessarily directly be mentoring someone, but you are an inspirational figure regardless of where you see yourself. You both are inspirational to a lot of black kids who look like you and are just seeing you. Like, it's just that we tend to really under-evaluate, like, or undervalue ourselves. So we think we don't have that kind of impact. But trust me, whilst you're thinking about your niche and where you fit in, you also have to look at yourself as someone that a lot of people are looking up to, right? Think about the society in general and how what you are interested in can impact society. Don't think about it now. Because if you think about now, you're not going to have any some sort of instant gratification doing science. It takes a while before you get results, right? Mm-hmm. So it is, it's just like medicine, right? You're going through medicine, studying, studying every day, taking loans, taking loans, taking loans, taking studying, going through the March process. You're not going to get an, like, an instant gratification that, oh, wow, I put in this, I get this back immediately. So it takes a lot of work. You know, research takes a lot of like, you know, troubleshooting. Like you do a lot. And so you have to understand that it's a process. It's a journey. It's not a race. You're not racing with anyone. So if you're able to figure out all these things out and understand that this is a process that you have to trust the process, um, um, I, I, you know, you, you, you'll, be, you'll be fine. And, you know, again, have the patience and know that, you know, everything comes with its ups and downs. Science, everything is all not nice and everything is like we're all nerds and we can all do things. No, you know, I, I think you have to also understand that there will be challenges that you're going to face. So, 
the challenges that you're going to face. Also, make sure that you have specific mentors that you can reach out to, right? And, and again, when I say mentors, they don't have to all be in science. You could have a mentor who deal with your personal stuff. You could have mentors who do deal with your academic stuff. And you could have mentors who deal with your scientific stuff, right? So identifying mentors, knowing your niche, looking at the bigger picture, understanding it's a process and it's not something that you're going to get an instant gratification from. Um, if you be able to, like, if you're able to understand all these like components of it, you'll be a great scientist. Science would mean so much to you. It will make sense to you. You would love doing it and you continue to do it and you will inspire the next generation to also do it. Ah, that's perfect. Um, we appreciate it. Um, Jenny, you got anything to add? No, that was really inspiring. I really appreciate you taking time to, to speak with us. And I know you, you've encouraged me to be a scientist and I, I'm not in medicine, but I don't know. I feel like maybe I could do it. Maybe I can. <laughs> hey, we can, we, can all, we can all do it. Thank you, thank you guys for having me. I really enjoy talking to you, Jordan. I really enjoy talking to you, Jane. And like, this, this is great. Uh, you know, I, I, you know I, I pray and hope that you guys continue to inspire the next generation of scientists. We appreciate it. We hope so. And you too, man. Um, you're also in this I mean White House. We already you already kinda <laughs> that's that's amazing actually. So that's wild. Uh but we do gotta get out of here. Um we appreciate everyone for listening. Um and till next time, don't forget to be scientists. Be scientists is a podcast by the Black Science Coalition and Institute or B Side. A 501c3 nonprofit. B Scientist is hosted by both Jenna Carpenter, chemist, and B Side's research and development officer, and Jordan Chapman, geoarchaeologist, and B Side's president. Music is produced by Della Rallo, and lyrics are by Ed Gunner. Special thanks to Michael, Mike, Cast, and Marshall, and the Plaza Abbey Studios. If you'd like to donate to B Side, visit our official website, bside.org. That's b side.org. Your donation supports the B Scientist and B Side's other projects. We couldn't do without you. So please tune in next time and always be scientists.